Hey everybody, this is David Collins from Ann Arbor Guitars. Today we're going to try to do a quick crash course on temperament, in particular how it relates to fretted instruments. Now, if there are any piano tuners or musicologists who happen to be watching, please forgive the extremely broad simplifications I'm about to make, but we're trying our best to make this very complicated topic as simple as possible. For those entirely new to this, uh, it does involve a little bit of math. No tests though, and you don't have to take notes. To start off, let's try to clarify what makes certain notes sound more in tune to us and others less so. At the most basic level, it really comes down to our preference for simple whole ratios. Let's hear a natural octave of an A440 above an A220. Forms a 2 to 1 ratio, perfect octave, sounds naturally in tune. A natural fifth above A220, which would be an E, at a 3 to 2 ratio would end up at 330 hertz. A natural fourth, or D, above our A220 would land at 293 and a third hertz, forming a perfect 4 to 3 ratio. These are examples of pure, natural, in-tune intervals, and at first glance it's hard to see why anyone should use anything else. Let's extend these ratios out a few degrees though and see where it leads us. We're going to start with an A110, and then play an E as a natural fifth above it. Now let's take this E and play a B as a natural 3 to 2 ratio, fifth above that. Extend another fifth above our B, bringing us to an F sharp. And finally, one more natural fifth brings us up to a C sharp, which falls at a frequency of 556 and 7 eighths hertz. Now let's look at another way to get from the A we started at up to that same C sharp though. Let's start with the A110 and move an octave up to A220. Then another octave from there to A440. Now let's play that C sharp above this A, which forms a natural major third at a 5 to 4 ratio. But wait, this brings us to 550 hertz, while the C sharp we ended up with by our path of uh, four natural fifths was quite a bit more sharp. What you see here is just one little example among the countless conundrums you'll find working with whole ratios. Basically, if you're playing in one key, these simple ratios create perfect natural harmonies. The further you stray from your home key, however, the worse things begin to sound. At its core, this is a mathematical inevitability. With ratios made up of different prime numbers, once you start to extend them out, compounding one on top of the other, they can only get more complicated and further and further from our nice, simple ratios. This is where temperament comes in. If we don't want that C-sharp sounding horrible as a third in our A chord, but we also want to be able to use it as a fifth in our F-sharp, we'll have to figure out some fair compromises. We're going to have to temper our intervals, or sacrifice some of their purity for practicality. Over the centuries, there have been countless arrangements devised for tempering. Some have tried to temper just a little bit in certain areas, leaving a fair number of keys fairly close to pure and pushing all the bigger problems into the other keys that just wouldn't be used. Others lean towards spreading the mess out more thinly and evenly. Uh, with this approach, you end up with more keys available for use, but in exchange you have to accept more harmonies being a bit further from pure. This path, of course, leads us to equal temperament, which has overwhelmingly become the standard for Western music today. Fretted instruments were of course early adopters. With their straight frets under multiple strings, equal temperament was just the most simple, natural option available. This doesn't mean everyone warmed up to it right away though. As General Thomas Perronet Thompson wrote in the early 19th century regarding the guitar's use of equal temperament, no professional singer would think of being accompanied on the guitar. And if the instrument maintains its ground in practice at all, it is in consequence of its convenience, of fashion, and above all, of the badness of people's ears. Strong words, uh, of course, at the time, people weren't used to these tempered intervals as the norm. Most listeners today are conditioned since birth. Uh, we just overlook the schisms constantly heard in equal temperament. General Thompson, however, would have nothing of it and proceeded to develop his enharmonic guitar to save us all from the torments of tempered thirds and sixths. His efforts were far from unique. Countless people over the years have sought out different solutions from Rene Lacote's movable frets in the mid-19th century or Tom Stone's interchangeable intonation system fretboards of the 70s for different keys and temperaments or the true temperament system available today, just to name a few. 
And of course, this was not limited to fretted instruments. Organs and pianos certainly went through a rebellious phase as well, with plenty of enharmonic keyboards to separate your D-sharp out from your E-flat. In the end, though, if you want a chromatic instrument or a guitar or mandolin with 12 notes per octave, which you can play in any key, you're pretty much stuck with equal temperament. I mean, sure, you could have a well-tempered guitar made for you, but your songs will probably all end up pretty sad and lonely because you won't have anyone else to play with you. So what kind of compromises are we actually talking about here? Well, equal tempered fifths are going to be fine, less than two cents sharp of natural, so no big noticeable problems. Fourths, about two cents flat, so again, just fine. Thirds and sixths, though, that's where it starts to get rough. Uh, a major third, like what you have between the open G and B string interval on a guitar, is going to sound about 14 cents sharp of where natural tuning would put it. Uh, minor thirds are a bit worse, but in the opposite direction, coming in at around 16 cents flat. So, if you do something like try to sweeten up that major third between the G and B strings on your open G or A chords, you're going to make that pair even worse when they have to play the role of a minor third in an E major chord. Now, every luthier or guitar tech has heard this many times over. Why have I never heard this before, or I've never noticed this problem before now? Well, remember what I said early about people's ears today being conditioned since birth to filter out these problems without even realizing it. Well, with experience and attentiveness, those filters can be easily shattered, and once you've started to hear the problems, they can be awfully hard to unhear. The issues have always been there, though, and it's been a challenge struggled with for centuries. Tune in to our next video, though, and we're going to share some secrets on how you can fix these problems once and for all, and finally make your guitar play fully in tune all the way up the neck. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you soon. Uh, sorry, no, that was a total lie. There's no fix, no perfect solution. Uh, if you ever hear promises of things like perfectly in tune all the way up the neck, I strongly advise you approach with a good deal of skepticism. When it comes to improving temperaments, what the right hand giveth, the left hand taketh away. That's not to say there aren't some useful tricks out there, or that bad intonation can't be improved. That's what we are going to talk about in our next video. There are a whole lot of things beyond temperament that can affect how in or out of tune your instrument may sound. And we're going to be looking at a lot of common causes and corrections for intonation issues. Still, it's important to recognize, even with intonation adjusted as perfectly as possible, there are still limitations of equal temperament that can never be fully eliminated by any adjustments, tricks, or widgets. If you'd like to see more of our videos, you can subscribe to us here on YouTube, follow us at Ann Arbor Guitars on Facebook, or visit our website at annarborguitars.com. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you soon.